welcome back to the show, Natira. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Um, mm. it's, it's great having you back to the show. After our first episode, we put the link to the one also on the show notes. So listen up, and unless you've already heard about that, everyone. So awesome, today, yes, that, that was very fun. And I'd love, Joe, I can hear, I think it's your dog that is making sounds. At first, I thought it was my stomach growling because <laughs> I didn't eat lunch yet, but I think it's your dog, yeah. which so is like, fine. Yeah, people who know the show know the dogs. So, um, they're part of the family, so you got to share some of that family vibe. Um, exactly. And yeah, so presentation techniques and how to prepare ourselves for being on stage, being seen, being heard. We talked a little bit about this in the previous episode Ooh. where you already shared some of your wisdom and now it'd be nice to hear what happened since and where we can take the conversation further. And there's a few talking points we will go through. But let's start with what happened since we spoke last and how's your business going? How? What are key experiences you made in the past couple of months with helping your clients, which might also be useful for our researchers to hear about? For the last six months, I've really been doing a lot of workshops with different teams at ad agencies, actually. So I've been coaching like um, groups of 10 to 20 people at a time, and we do weekly like a weekly session over a month. And the focus for that is on confidence in public speaking or presentation skills. And that has been great. So it's been really a chance for me to both kind of teach a more general approach to, you know, what audiences care about and what they don't and how to be more dynamic and comfortable in front of them. And, and then also really help the different participants with specific challenges that they have. Mm -hmm. And so, so I've been doing that and then also do so I do some one on one, like over zoom confidence, public speaking prep practice, like when someone is, I'll have cl some clients who are going to be doing a lot of public speaking or going to have to do some a webinar and are just not looking forward to it and mm -hmm. um yeah so help them through that it, that reminds me of a panel situation i just had at, uh, at the frankfurt book fair a couple of weeks ago where i was invited as an expert which is pretty flattering and then with the flattering comes the nervousness like oh my god am i gonna live up to the expectation and yeah and the other panelists were also experts. And I was like, oh my God, can I compete with what they have to say? I mean, not to compete, but can I kind of, you know, keep the threshold high? Does that make sense? Exactly, um, totally. <laughs> and, and then I had a friend's colleague also coach me into the situation, who basically just said, you can do this and just believe in yourself. And then, that, and then I, I just, fire I, I was on fire on stage and i i was being asked the question i was in full focus and was so happy afterwards like that That's was so like, great it's like the first time i i felt so happy about a performance <laughs> and do you remember did you feel happy during it did you feel that kind of fire energy focus i think so like i was pretty energized but i was also fully in my element mm -hmm. and i i think i had the comfort of being trusted by the invitation to the panel like trusted with the expertise that i could deliver yeah. i had the support from a friend and colleague who knew me personally and could talk me through my fears and oh my god i'm so nervous kind of thing and yeah. let, let, let go of that and then it on the panel i was just an element and i, I was in a friendly comforting situation of colleagues talking about what's up um, on the topic and each of us bringing in their respective expertise, which is why we were invited to the panel. And the exactly. moderator was super nice also. Yeah. And professional and very supportive. I mean, supportive as in very friendly and asking all right. questions and supportive in a way that he made the entrance really 
uplifting and appreciating us. That's great. So helping people through their fears as they embark on a speech, uh, pub yeah, public speech of some sort, be it in a, a webinar or an actual conference in person, a panel discussion, where you expose yourself to the cameras and an audience. <laughs> and I thought I was camera shy. Is that a term you use in English? Uh -huh. it's like very much German one-on-one, -on -one, one one-to-one translation. Okay. Um, and I felt like oh, the camera is worse of a threat to me than an actual audience. Mm. Is that common? Yeah. And did, in that book fair, did you have both a camera and yeah. an audience? But I didn't care as much because I felt so comfortable after the pep mm. talk by my friend and then also the all the other supporting pictures. Yeah. Um, so also the camera, I think what had was when way in the back. So it wasn't just, you know, in, in my face kind of thing. It was not in the front row, but in the back row where I could ignore it easily. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how uh so how did it feel when you were in the on the panel? Good. Like I think, yeah, no, I think I I totally went into the all the things that I had learned over the years and also be, being reminded of in the pep talk, focus on the audience, find somebody in the audience who looks nice to look at, to build confidence, and then talk to that person and find another person on the other end of the room kind of thing. So I think that's what helps in having actual people in front of you instead of just a camera or a webinar situation. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that brings up actually on one <clears throat> in one workshop, I was working with some people who a challenge for them and, and I share this is that I, I'm very sensitive to eye contact and people's facial expressions. So when people change, you know, like naturally change the way they're looking as I'm speaking, I can get very like I'm just sensitive to it and uh so so one of the things that really really helps is yeah is finding that face if you are on zoom and or if you're in an audience looking at an audience yeah to finding that face that is happy and engaged and speaking to that and then finding another one and another one and for any face and this is particularly true on zoom for any face that does just look totally disengaged or uh distracted or angry because some people just have angry face as they listen to zoom and watch zoom exactly and to not read anything into it and that that there's the privilege i think of speaking on zoom and you get to choose which audience members you really are speaking to and not worry about whether or not they're because they're looking like angry or distracted not actually thinking that you need to do anything different to change what you're doing mm. that you can continue going and just speaking to that positive person mm. yeah what if you don't see the audience I had a situation where the lights were so strong that I couldn't make, like I knew there were like hundreds of people and or not hundreds, but maybe 120. And I couldn't see any of them because of the lights were so bright. That's so for that, I advise using your brain to picture the most wonderful engaged audience you can imagine. People who are hanging on your words and to smile at them and like a, assume they are they've got your back assume mm -hmm. that they are the most um wonderful audience ever how can you get yourself into that assumption just by imagining it i'm saying just because it sounds so easy and i fear it's not as easy as one might think Okay, so how would I prepare someone who has never felt what I would I would prepare them how I would do it is I would ask them to close their eyes and to imagine standing on a stage and 
feeling themselves, feeling their feet on the floor and feeling and seeing that audience out there. And I would imagine them, and then I would ask them to imagine them. What is that, that look, this smile, I would start to help them see what those people look like. And that kind of the smile on their face, mm. the, that look in their eyes, when, when you're, you're just so there with someone and you're just listening and you're so interested. And I would start to have them practice with visualizing that and, and, and feeling what it feels like to talk with someone when mm. they're just really, really intrigued by what you're saying and it's important information for them. And so kind of do that homework of practicing, feeling that kind of joy and connection with an audience. Mm. Yeah, I think that that can really work in building an imagination off. I think a couple of years ago, I heard an advice in that direction where put yourself back into a situation mm -hmm. where you felt really comfortable with a friend, with a family member. How, like, yeah, just remember a situation where you felt super safe. Yeah. And then there's, there's something that I will do with clients, which is around which is around grounding or anchoring into your best, most authentic self. And that is around. So for that exercise, it's about think like coming and thinking about for yourself, what is a time in your life, a moment, a scene when you felt the most yourself and the most um, like enervated, the most vibrant, the most vital you might have been a little bit afraid it might have been a little but like thrilling but that moment a moment in time when you felt like this is like this is me this is this is me and i feel really strong in that to go and remember that before you do a talk or you're in some challenging environment that that the the chemicals that that produces in you is so powerful if you can bring yourself back to that state right before you go on stage or go in front of the camera, that can do so much for you to bring you to give you confidence in yourself and just engagement with yourself, because that's actually really what's so important is that sense of engagement with you, with yourself, and that helps with your connection with the audience. But first and foremost, it's feeling connected in here. Yeah, well, now that you mentioned that, we, I think in the previous episode, we talked also a little bit about authenticity and what that really means. And um, I would like, as you just said what you mm -hmm. said, I would like to go back towards what does it mean to knowing yourself, how that matters in being able to communicate with an audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's some, so what I was just explaining before, that is something that has been studied as a way for someone to be more confident and more uh, engaging in front of an audience that that exercise actually has a halo effect beyond uh and in terms of the authenticity that's just, there there's something that a lot of us if we go into a scary situation we abandon who who we are kind of like there's a there's a sense of being so focused on other things that we're not, not as connected with what with what matters to us and and if you can remind yourself of those things that matter most to you like um you know maybe it is your you know someone in your family and that and this experience that you had it somehow keeps you feeling strong and anchored well, okay, I get it now. So, yeah, like reconnecting, even despite the fear of exposing yourself on stage, the fight or flight thing that might come up, which is just there um, to take notice of and then do it's it. Anyway. Just, exactly. It's just there. It's just a bonus. It's a bonus of being human. Yeah. Uh, and the legacy of humankind goes back to 
I don't know. Yeah. No review. Yeah. One, uh, one thing I think I mentioned in the last episode that is really powerful is the doing a power pose before, mm -hmm. beforehand mm -hmm. with like the arms up, chin up, embodying, uh, it's the Amy Cuddy power pose, mm -hmm. which is embod like take, take two minutes, embody absolute like success, victory, thrill, mm. and openness. And what that does is it does transform the way our body feels. And it make, mm. means that you can go out in front of a in front of an audience and and feel good and feel available to connect with them. This is like, and the power pose, because I've, I, I love the technique, I believe in it. I've read up on it, and there are some critiques who say, oh, this is just, you know, it's not going to work, blah, blah, blah. Even some researchers deny its functionality, but, or it's, it's reasoning. But if, if we just stretch and kind of stretch our muscles, get rid of the tension that comes up due to the fears that we experience, I mean, that's part of the process with the power pose. Um, like right. getting us bigger than we actually are. And then that also helps the brain to... I mean, everybody can feel it as we try it right now, right? Just sit up. Um, yeah. So, so, so yeah. Amy, yeah. Amy Cuddy did this research at at Harvard, where she was in the business school, and um, yeah, it was a phenomenal piece of research, and a lot she's continued to write and um, publish about it. And there was there was this big backlash that happened, and it was became almost like a bully campaign a bullying campaign experience and she's been very outspoken about what that was like to have to have done so much work and then to have it be um vilified and and so that that's actually a really interesting thing to look at from an academic standpoint but yeah so so the power pose if we just look at the power pose it is you know standing standing up shoulders back arms up in a v shape and then importantly to have your chin raised and you can smile you can but the idea is you're just um like it's like you're crossing the finish line of a race of just joy and thrill and power and that is something that just has a chemical effect in terms of lowering our cortisol and raising serotonin. I think that I think those are the the chemicals that we're talking about. I think so too. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not a new. <laughs> Whoever is listening of that discipline, please for your um, proof of concept. Um, and there's actually research papers out there which I will also try and get hold of. And the thing with academics, there's. There's a certain degree of opinion making in academia, and that's part of the process. There's nothing wrong or, or false about it. And we can only un unshovel so many facts as what we, and the facts are also embedded in what we actually know today within a certain discipline. So there needs to be a degree of opinion in it. And then there's always those who always critique and are negative about other people's findings. So that's yeah. part of the equation. So, yeah, uh, just answering or just responding to what you mentioned briefly about, and that also as part of the scientific discourse, there's also value in questioning mm. certain findings, mm. but it mm. needs like what I would love for us for academics to rediscover as a culture is to do that in a supportive approach and not in a mm -hmm. nagging approach kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing that is, that comes up a lot and I find myself when I am coaching someone in a, in a more formal presentation for a webinar, let's say, that there's, sometimes there's a, a real propensity to stick to all the facts and just and just speak to all the all the details and all the facts kind of as a default like that's the default and but if you're going to be listening to that talk you're going to be watching that 
webinar, you're still human. And as a human, we, we like stories and we like, and, and also to be inspired, engaged, have things that are interesting said mm -hmm. to us. So, so one of the, one of the exercises I will do is around focusing on impact over accuracy. Mm -hmm. So, and which is not to say be inaccurate, but more, what is the most impactful thing about this that I can share right here? And not thinking about covering all the bases of what that presentation is about, mm -hmm. but think of it as this is the connection mechanism that you can have with your audience. And how can you make, how can you, how can you structure it so that you are you're making pictures come up in their heads you're making pictures in your own head and you're and you're yeah you're taking them on a story a bit mm. that's brilliant and it, is it is it going towards the why question mm. like for a presenter knowing and um distilling the reason for the presentation to that particular audience, but more so, so also to whom, but why am I sharing this here? And for yeah. Back to what is my research about? What have, what have I found? And how does it have an impact to what I'm trying to solve in the bigger mm -hmm. picture? Yeah. And to actually, to know that I think is, is to do that kind of homework beforehand of thinking, what is the, what is the most important thing that I want to get across in this in this presentation? What is the what is the thing that is um, most exciting about this work to me as a researcher? What do I think? You know, like asking some of those questions, uh, interrogating your own experience and your own uh, thoughts about the presentation, so that you can. You can come at it in a more in a more direct way and also more engaging way and and more personal way because we're attracted to other people do you know like we want to listen to other people and that's and i know that's a lot of the work that you do is like mm -hmm. trying to bring like having people own the work that they do and mm -hmm. speak from their experience and not yeah. go into that passive place. Yeah, exactly. It's also and and it's it serves authenticity, what we spoke about earlier. Like it totally allows us to be authentic, to remind ourselves and also share with the wider audience why we do the kind of work that we do. Like these little anecdotes, what got me here. Um, that's the most engaging um piece of information a presenter can share with their audience the, the funniest things are when and it's usually the more ex amongst academics it's usually the seniors that do that a lot because they've given so many presentations on a particular topic and then it's probably also re relieving for them to just share an anecdote of what happened on the journey to that venue <laughs> and and that's you know everybody can relate oh yeah my taxi was also delayed and <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly um, and then the artistry in that is about you know if it is a like a hot start where you're really mm -hmm. starting with the the crazy thing that just happened on mm -hmm. your way to this panel or this talk or you know you're telling some kind of story that does connect in and mm -hmm. it 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 it's a, like a fast connection to the audience mm -hmm. and and then, and then the artistry is really, yeah, having it really connect mm -hmm. and grabbing the att the attention of people right away, and then and then moving on, mm -hmm. and then and then keeping it going and go on to the presentation. Yeah, because it's it also serves as first impression, right? Somebody comes on stage is being assessed by the audience. Mm -hmm. People are like, oh, I'm hungry. Can I listen to another talk? Like, oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like, oh, and, the, and the, actually, the, and the, the research shows that the audience, the audience, the way they judge a speaker right away, the first thing they are judging for is their warmth and trustworthiness. The warmth and trustworthiness is the number one first like um, quali qualifier uh, characteristic 
thing that people that an audience cares about. And then second is their competence. Do they know what they're talking about? And that's fascinating to me because I've done most of the work that I've done in a professional environment. And most all people really focus on is the competence. Do I know what I'm talking about? And they go in hard on showing and proving that they know what they're talking about and bypass the warmth and trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. And that is the key, that's such a key piece that some people really do need to mm -hmm. dial up. And it's, it's so important for communication, this human aspect. And I think what I also reminded a friend colleague recently of as she was preparing for a job interview or something, um, I was like, you know what? They already know you're good. You don't have to prove that anymore at this point. Same with an invitation for a keynote speech. They already know you know what exactly. You're about. So just talk about it and then show your humanness alongside. Yeah, because that's what people. Yeah, really. And and that warmth and going back to what we were saying earlier, like that warmth and trustworthiness. If that's something that you're gonna try to to make more powerful in your in your presentations that it one of the, the woman you, when you go back and you do some of that work about your peak experience in terms of what was that time when you felt the most alive the most yourself the most excited what is that if you can ground yourself in that ahead of time that is something that really helps with the warmth and trustworthiness the other the other thing is really around your eye contact the openness of your stance and and make yeah making eye contact sometimes like if you're standing on a stage and you have multiple people in front of you or you're in the front of the room of making eye contact for a couple seconds with individual people that that's a show of being trustworthy because you're not hiding you're not kind of just avoiding the gaze of the people in the room and just sticking to your material yeah so what I hear, and I'm only becoming aware of that as we speak, so this, I, I keep having these moments in these episodes, so so enlightening. <laughs> so basically, to whatever we said before this, is it like, just imagine talking to a friend when you're on stage, is that it? Can we bother Th that? That's one thing that you can absolutely do. You can, and that could be sometimes a prep that you do ahead of time. Like, what would it be like? All right, so I'm going to give this presentation. Let's say you do a 10 minute presentation. I'm going to do it as if I'm talking to my mother. I'm going to do it like I'm talking to my best friend. Mm -hmm. And that can actually, yeah, break the ice a bit in terms of getting it to be really, what are you saying? Really? At, like here um, in some of the the presentation work, like when I was coaching ad agency teams for new business pitches, so mm -hmm. you'd be pitching a piece of business, you'd be uh, the team would be would have a presentation and they're answering questions for the for the client, and the client asks a question, and sometimes the answer it's like the qu client has asked a question the agency comes to the client's office and is going to respond to all those questions and sometimes the answer to those questions is so indirect and so much through like through the own the agency's own lens of how we do things at this agency that you've kind of lost what the question is and what the answer is and mm -hmm. so before a presentation that's a really good exercise to do of what is this audience or this person what do they want to know what do they need to know and what in the most direct way is my answer to that and at least have that in your mind because that i think is a really good safety net whenever you're going out and 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 speaking it's interesting that you mentioned that i think this can also um happen to quite a few researchers you know later to have to talk to people from a different sector in society. It's one thing to talk to other academics. It's one thing in your own discipline. There's another thing to talk to academics in another discipline, different language. I'm not yes. about like actual national languages or you know whatever that means, but culture, like speaking culture in different sectors and disciplines. 
so people like biologists uh, when when biologists and philosophers or psychologists talk they they lose communication i would bet after two or three sentences because they don't just don't speak the same language exactly exactly like the connection is just lost at that point you can be the most brilliant philosopher but if mm -hmm. you're talking to someone from a completely different you know side of the academic sphere you're not necessarily gonna be connecting because your words are all everything is different yeah different acronyms different concepts different phrases that have fun yeah. into a speaking country but and, now and and that like if that's the situation that say you're you're going into then my advice would be to, to to really get to know that audience that you will be speaking to and so getting to know them how, how like is there are there people in your world that are from that sphere that you can talk to and so that you're able to come to them and share the information that you have but do it in a way that actually lands and and registers with them hmm. But that takes homework. That definitely takes homework. Yes, it's actually learning a different language almost. Yeah. <laughs> another sector. What's your experience in get, preparing NGO, like third sector people? Is that what you say? Like nonprofit people? With, to a business event kind of pitch. How, like what? Okay, I'm asking because we have a similar. Um, transition to make between academics and corporate people when academics apply to, for jobs outside academia and then what's commonly known or referred to as the elevator pitch is what are your credentials why are you applying for this position and then an academic would would come and say oh just look at my references and the, the publication list that i have in my cv and i've published here and there and in that journal like industry leaders don't care or people in the industry don't care about any of that they want kind of experience on certain things that academics usually learn on the job without getting certificates for that so yeah just to give an idea an insight about the the misalignment between the two sectors um yeah 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 but i, I think you already said that so i don't want to like it takes homework and awareness of what counts yeah and yeah practice on speaking about yourself and what you know what what do you care about what are the things that really interest you about the work that you're doing and like try to try i think it's important to try to bring it to down a bit and less of a removed cv uh description of facts about your background but really kind of th bring yeah make it more personal mm -hmm. oh a lot to digest already as we talk you and i um yeah. but i i really enjoy it it's like it's nice okay yeah so i was gonna say one other thing joe which is hmm. that sometimes the so let me, t I was in, it was probably about 15 years ago, it was a long time ago. And I was with an agency and I led the new business team. So we were going to a big client, big, big client in Tokyo. And so we flew out there to do a presentation and we're, we get there and walk into the room and it's a room again, it's like 15 years ago, the room it's this long boardroom and there are all Japanese men sitting around the table and they most of them are wearing masks and this is before masks were where what everyone wears everywhere and so it was pretty intimidating imposing mm -hmm. and so the team started so the first person got up and presented and then it was the second person that was getting up and he was the head of strategy and uh he's he's making his way up to the front of the room and he trips and he goes flying forward he trips over one of this the wheels of the one of the chairs mm -hmm. and just goes flying forward I, and i am thinking oh no like oh no what a disaster 
But the truth is, he gets up and looks at everyone around the table. And everyone that were the ones that you can see are smiling. There's just this sense of like broken, like you've broken the ice. And now we're all here. We're Uh all here into this mortifying (laughs) moment. (laughs) And then he spoke. And, and I loved that. I, I love, I mean, yeah, afterwards, I loved that experience, but, but in terms of when things do go wrong, because things go wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, I read this, uh, note from Viv Groskop, who's a phenomenal, phenomenal, she has a podcast called how to own the room. And she, she had this great comment about when disaster strikes to take a lesson from what stand-up comics do, which is to narrate what's happened and then move on. So don't ignore it. Mm-hmm. You could say, like in my case, wow. let's say I'm I'm speaking and I'm, let's say I wear dentures and they all fall out, right? Mm-hmm. So all my teeth, I go, it looks like my teeth have all fallen out. Let me just put them back in and and then go on there's something around the narration and acknowledgement and moving on that helps it makes the audience a like you more by by just messing up there's something about it that's just it's a connective episode none we don't want to do it but but it is there is some power in it and Mm -hmm. secondly yeah just not trying to hide it but actually acknowledge it but then move on with what you're saying yeah, which also reminds me um, what I heard from a mentor. We are not robots, we're human beings. And the world is real and we can, uh, what's the word? We can stumble and fall mm-hmm. and have a consequence and then get up again and move on in whatever yeah. situation we are in. Exactly. Hmm. And, and if the braver you are to narrate those moments, and and own them i think it does something also for us as the as the person who did it and yeah and it and it creates a stronger connection with everyone around us okay here's a here's a thing for you i've been building up for that and as we were speaking i was like am i going to share this or not and now you kind of prepare the stage for this so here's the thing it's been a couple of years ago. I was invited for a TED talk. And that was when I was engaged in all kinds of projects. Uh, you know me right now a little bit. So I like to invest myself in many things that I care about. So I thought, okay, that's cool. Thanks for, for the flattering invitation. And it's a TED talk. That's cool. It's um, yeah, that's serious. So early in my career, what well, was well, the wow. TEDx talk? So not the big big stage in Canada, but um, so the TEDx thing. Um, and I went. I didn't prepare, so I have many excuses I could bring to the table. I didn't. I, I conceptualized what I was gonna talk about. I prepared slides in there, but I didn't really practice. And I know that it takes practice for TED talk, but then I didn't have the headspace because my mom was sick in hospital and this and that happened. Just the constant overload of a solo entrepreneur. So I went, nonetheless, I was like, yeah, show up and shine. And whatever happens, happens. And whatever happened, was meant to happen, happened. So what happened was I froze on stage. Like, and I, and it was so long. You know how they sometimes tell you, and I also tell this other people in my presentation technique courses like you you freeze and then you collect your thoughts and you move on and it probably doesn't feel as long to the audience as it feels for you so just keep going but apparently it's not <laughs> quite <laughs> <laughs> and I finished and I was like what's this what I what I asked you earlier about like I didn't see the audience I wasn't well prepared. So it was all these factors that led to me freezing. Also, the topic wasn't really mine worth a TED talk. I decided to dedicate this opportunity to 
a project I was participating in, but it was not really mine to mm -hmm. report on. Yeah, so I went down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> And I felt so bad afterwards. And I, I spoke to other other speakers at that event. They were like, you know, at every TEDx event, there's like 10 or so other speakers. And I, yeah, and we became kind of friends, colleagues. And I had a few trusted people. I exchanged some debriefing thoughts around the situation. And we distilled towards that, yeah, maybe you didn't prepare well enough. Or maybe it wasn't really your talk to give here. Yeah. That. So, yeah, exactly exactly uh, okay this is on record not on my own show people exactly <laughs> see but that's the thing is like owning it and and moving on and also what I, so it's been a couple of years i can remember it was certainly pre-covid so it must have been 2018 or 17 or something so and i survived and i'm yeah. on and i'm on stage again and not only at the after, Frankfurt after. Book Fair, no, no less. Okay. I mean, the fact that you did that at the Frankfurt Book Fair, that's pretty I, impressive. It didn't take me five years to get on stage again, but yeah. <laughs> but, um, and now I think I'm ready for another TED, TED talk, if anybody's listening of the organizers. Yeah. And I, I think I think that would be that would be great. And it's interesting while I'm watching you, because I just watched you with my own eyes, like watch you with that story in mind. And there's something around when just when you were laughing and that like totally open, funny smile glow that you had, that that's something that a lot of times we forget to bring that to a talk that we're giving. We forget to bring that that vitality and humanness and fun and engagement and mm -hmm. if you if just bring that into what you're doing in front of a state in front of an audience that alone will really help mm -hmm. i think it just hijacked my vulnerability getting over it moment for a, a lesson to the audience but that's fine <laughs> That's a lesson to you, though, too, my dear. That's like, yeah, just absolutely go all in. I'm excited for your next TED Talk. Oh, yeah. And even if it takes 10 years before that happens, that's okay. But there are also think... other speakers who said, oh, this is TED Talk number, I don't know, five or so for music. What? Okay, so it's becoming redundant. Is that it? <laughs> Anyways, but... Talking about which, like, I will also share the Amy Cuddy, Cud? Cuddy, Cuddy, Tark, and like in the show notes to this one, because we mentioned her. Um, so there's brilliant TED Talks to explore. Yeah. I just hope yeah. that one day I will also contribute. That you'll contribute one. I think you will, Joe. I have a, I have a feeling that you will be. Anyways, otherwise this show remains an audio and I just run my own show. That's also cool. Exactly. <laughs> TED Talk anyways, but it's good learnings we can draw from there. Yeah. It's just, oh, that's the yeah. thing. Like most TED speakers have that authenticity and that joy and spark in their eyes when they present. So that's something yeah. anyone can really learn from them. Yeah. Yeah. And my recording is not online, so I was gonna ask you that and then I'm like, maybe I don't want to ask you, but it was uh, okay, so, so it's not online. That it wasn't even fixable, apparently. <laughs> or I didn't even want to fix it. Like, okay. I could have just edited it to so to make it work, but no. <laughs> yeah. And also I said like maybe maybe this is not for for YouTube. <laughs> or maybe it is like big fair moment on on the TEDx stage for you. This is how not to do it. Prepare better. I have you not, <laughs> not in hospital while you prepare for should prepare. Anyways. Yeah. It's not always the right time for everything. So that's there's exactly well, said that. And there's probably another opportunity. And even if not, it's not another game. Um, there's other games to play. And yeah. 
But also, mm. if an opportunity arises, first of all, you don't have to jump on every bandwagon, but we can. And if we do, mm. let's make sure we own our story. I think that's my lesson from that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Okay. Cool. So there's a few talking points we haven't touched upon, but I feel there's room for another episode in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. I would love to do that with you. Yes, so that, let's do it. Thanks for joining. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Joe. Speak to you soon.